Most Christians believe that the four canonical Gospels are the reliable eyewitness testimony of men who were there with Jesus, men who saw with their own eyes leprosy cured with a word, blind men given their sight back, and even the dead raised back to life. So, if these documents represent the written testimony of eyewitnesses of the events, let's cross-examine them according to the federal rules of evidence. As you might guess from the title, the Federal Rules of Evidence is a collection of rules that govern what evidence can be presented, what constitutes an unreliable witness, and so on. I'll be using this checklist I created, which is derived from the information found in the Federal Rules of Evidence. There are two main categories. The first contains categories that represent conditions that, if satisfied, would be sufficient to impeach the witness, disallowing him to give any testimony at all. The second main category will represent how the four Gospels compare to each other. All of these can be summed up as a determination of credibility. One X in any one of the upper categories is sufficient to impeach the witness, and thus the witness cannot testify, period. Any evidence they may have had, whether true or not, is null and void at that point. Once we see how the Gospel authors fare, we'll examine them as a whole to see if their testimonies are generally in line with each other or not. I now call my first witness to the witness stand. Most scholars agree that the Gospel of Mark was written anonymously. Despite what the early church fathers claimed, we have no idea who wrote it. The author doesn't mention his name and doesn't write, I saw this or I heard this from so-and-so. It's written in the form of a fictional story in the third person with an omniscient narrator point of view. So, we'll put an X in the anonymous category. This alone is sufficient to dismiss his entire testimony as according to the federal rules of evidence. Witnesses are not allowed to be completely anonymous. But let's continue. I'll quickly allow that the author is competent to give testimony as his gospel seems quite cohesive and not something easily done by someone insane or mentally handicapped. So, let's leave this blank and move on. The next category, hearsay, is normally applied to a single piece of evidence. However, in this case, Mark's entire testimony falls into the category of hearsay. Church tradition says that Mark was not recording things he personally witnessed, but was recording the memories of Peter. After their departure of Peter and Paul from earth, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. And the presbyter said this, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ, for he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. But afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessities of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Lord's sayings. Wherefore Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them. For of one thing he took a special care, not to omit anything he had heard, and not to put anything fictitious into the statements. I just have to smile when I read that last part. If church tradition is correct, Mark was not present at any of the events and his knowledge of the events is hearsay. Another way we know that the author was not an eyewitness is that he makes errors involving Palestinian geography that no one living there and being a witness of the events at the time would have made. I'll look at one example of this in a moment. Another problem is that the earliest copy of Mark we have is actually a copy of a copy of a copy and so on. Even if a Mark wrote the gospel, his testimony is hearsay about hearsay about hearsay. Alice told me that Jane said that Betty claimed that 
You get the idea. Since the author was not an eyewitness, has no personal knowledge of the events, an X in the hearsay box, and let's keep going. If a witness has something to gain by giving their testimony, they are said to be biased, and this is sufficient to disallow their testimony. The author of Mark, almost certainly a Christian, clearly has something to gain by writing his gospel, and I dare say one of his goals was not just to tell what happened as an impartial witness to a set of events, but to propagate his particular views, to spread Christianity, and to vilify the Jewish leaders of the recent past. Our witness, whoever he was, is clearly biased such that he has a motivation to fudge the facts in order to paint Christianity in a more positive light. We'll check the bias box and move on. If a witness provides inconsistent statements, we can impeach the witness and throw out his testimony in its entirety because the witness is shown to be unreliable. Like all of these categories, the point is to discover any area in which the witness has proven to be unreliable. In the eighth chapter of Mark, Peter understands that Jesus must die and come back from the dead. But in the ninth chapter, Peter does not understand that Jesus must die. How can Peter understand and a chapter later seem to completely forget what he learned? In the sixth chapter of Mark, the disciples are sent out to spread the good news. However, they've yet to learn who this Jesus fellow is and apparently don't find out until two whole chapters later. I don't think the disciples would go traveling through all of Israel just on the word of some friend they had recently met. No, they need to find out that this is, in fact, the Son of God. They need to be convinced, and they're not convinced until after His resurrection. Are we seeing our witness writing fiction here? And did he forget that the disciples had yet to learn Jesus' true identity before he had sent them off to preach the good news? We'll put an X in the inconsistent statements box and move on. Mark's work is cast as a historical narrative, but I claim it's an allegorical one as well. Nonetheless, Mark is trying to give it the air of historicity by including real places and real people. Unfortunately, his efforts fall a bit short. One example is found in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus sails across the Sea of Galilee to the land of the Gerasenas. Codices, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Beza all contain the term Gerasenas. Then we are told that 2,000 pigs ran down an embankment into the sea. But a quick look at a map will show that the land of the Gerasenas was a good 30 miles south of the Sea of Galilee. If Jesus disembarked at the southernmost bank of this lake, it would have taken him an entire day of walking to reach the area of the Gerasenas. There was certainly no way pigs could walk down a 30-mile embankment to rush into the Sea of Galilee, which was not a sea, but a lake. Matthew caught this blunder and altered it from Gerasenas to Gadaranas, which gets Jesus about 25 miles closer and conceivably into the land of believability. Luke did not alter Mark as Papyrus 75, an early 3rd century copy of Luke, matches Mark, so obviously he knew as much about Palestinian geography as Mark did. We can see that Mark was not at all familiar with the land about which he wrote, and if we are to take Mark as giving us a historical account of things that actually happened, this huge blunder shows that Mark was not giving us a factual account, but a fictional one. Even though this seems to be an error rather than a lie or an attempt at deception. Also, as I showed earlier, Mark knew he was writing fiction when he cast James and John as the Dioscuri, the sons of Zeus, and he actually had Jesus rename them as such. Mark borrowed from Homer's Odyssey as well as other previous literary sources. 
Mark also makes errors in his trial scene that contradict what we know of Jewish customs of the first century. For example, having Jesus' trial occur on Passover, which would not happen on a high holy day, and having Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin at night, which, for a capital offense, was not allowed, and so on. For someone supposedly giving us the facts, Mark fails the test of truthfulness. An X, and let's continue. As far as I know, Mark doesn't directly contradict himself. We'll leave the contradiction box blank. So, from what we know about the first gospel, it fails the test for general reliability with flying colors. Our anonymous witness has made many errors concerning Palestinian geography, Jewish customs, and he's given us deliberately crafted fiction in many of his scenes. He's provided inconsistent statements as to just when the disciples understood who Jesus was, as well as other inconsistencies. We don't have anything close to an original autograph from the witness, and even church fathers such as Irenaeus and Eusebius admit that the author was not an eyewitness, which makes his entire testimony hearsay. According to the Federal Rules of Evidence, Mark is an extremely unreliable witness, and just one of these X's is enough to throw his entire testimony out of the courtroom. On to Matthew. 